right, everyone. Uh, Gail, is that more or less everyone? Okay, great. All right, everyone. Um, for those unfamiliar, I'm Martin van Staden. I'm a board and exco member here at the Free Market Foundation. And I want to thank everyone here for joining us this evening and, of course, everyone online. Um, we haven't had an evening event in a while. I think it's been a few months uh, due to some turbulence in the foundation. But now we're in an optimistic transitional phase uh, and uh, from 1 January next year. David and Sarah, who is in attendance here tonight, uh, will be joining us as our new chief executive. So we are quite, uh, quite excited about that. So while this is the last event of the year, I'm confident that uh, 2023 uh, holds much promise and excitement for the work of the Foundation. I also have the pleasure of introducing the speaker for tonight. Chris Hutting is one of the most recognizable faces of South Africa's small but passionate liberty movement. I had the honor of working with Chris uh, as a researcher here at the FMF for many years, and uh, we continue to work together today uh, at a different organization. He is now primarily with the Center for Risk Analysis. He is a member of the Advisory Council of the Initiative for African Trade and Prosperity, and he sits on the Executive Board of the Global Trade and Innovation Policy Alliance. Chris is a man of very deep thought, uh, and he holds a master's degree in philosophy from the University of Stellenbosch to, uh, to make that real. So tonight, Chris will present us with a st strategic intelligence report on where South Africa is and where it is going. And I hope all of you are as excited as I am to gain from the insights he will provide us here tonight. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thanks very much, Martin, for that uh, introduction. Quite something to be introduced by, by someone else in our, in our budding liberty movement. It actually feels surreal sometimes. Um, as Martin, Martin mentioned, I work at the Center for Risk Analysis as a senior policy analyst. <laughs> Uh, the CRA provides analysis to businesses, um, other think tanks along the lines of political and economic assessments, trying to make sense of the risks in the country and also globally so that we can navigate those as best as we can. In terms of today's presentation, we're going to cover where South Africa has been, where it's going, and both the economic and ideological trends uh, that factor into that. So I'm going to present you with a lot of statistics and data and our interpretation thereof to try and make sense of where the country might be going. Um, as we go through the presentation, I want you to keep in mind here the analogy of the ANC as the mighty buffalo that has dominated the South African political savanna up until this point. Um, many analysts and commentators thought that maybe a lion would emerge to take down the buffalo, but uh, as we prog progress through the presentation, we'll look at whether that will come about or maybe in a different sort of format. But just keep that idea in mind of this mighty buffalo and what might happen to it or not. Just to give you an idea of the overview of the different sections, we'll go through the state of the nation, some economics, um, where the state is at the moment, also look at different political parties, the likelihood of reform, and then finally a political shift going forward into 2024. So we start off with the state of the nation. We chose this image from last year, July, when we had riots in KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng. And we use this to point out just the very like, high likelihood of this happening again in the future with, for example, a 44% unemployment rate on the expanded definition. This is not to justify something like violence or looting, but when you tell people that they're going to get a job or they're going to get a house or something and that those wishes are frustrated for years, uh, you should not be taken aback when that sort of thing happens. And I don't think South Africa is adequately addressing that to ensure that this sort of thing doesn't happen again in the future. Of course, with the con concomitant risks for businesses and communities. How do you prepare for that uh, accordingly? So in 2021, we at the CRA did a, a bit of polling to try and find out from South Africans, from respondents, how they feel about their state of, of quality of life. Or do they think their lives um, are the be whether their lives are better, the same or worse than it had been five years ago? And at that point, of course, we had an ANC conference where President Ramaphosa won out over the other candidate in Kosozana Klamini Zuma with promises of great reform, job creation, investment, that sort of thing. So we like to look at things over a longer period of time to measure that. We don't want to take data just on a sort of individual day-to-day -day basis, but more of a longer time trend to see. So in terms of the responses we got, you can see for the vast majority of our respondents, they feel that their quality of life had worsened. So this can be things like service.
a job. It could just be how you feel about your family's future, your children's future. Those various aspects are covered. For some of them, their lives, their quality of life had improved, and for others it had stayed the same. But for the vast majority, that sense of frustration, that things are, not, are getting worse, things aren't turning around. So what are the options? How do we turn things around? How do we take matters into our own hands, perhaps? And that, again, refers back to that issue of violent and unrest. Again, not to justify it, but maybe for some people, they feel that's their only outlet to affect change. And this feeds into this next statistic where you can see from uh, 90, 1997 until uh, 2020, the increase in the proportion of protests that are violent. So you can see a steady decrease to this sort of idea of two eras from 94 until 2008 as South Africa did implement good pro-market reforms. There was more economic growth, more people with a job after apartheid. There was a sense that things were improving, so you had a less uh, proportion of protests that were violent. But since then, the steady increase going ever upwards as people feel maybe the only way that anyone is going to listen to them is if they take to the street and, uh, and engage in more destructive behavior. Now we just look at the state of the economy, and here are images of Madupi power station. So you've got this ideological idea of the developmental state, and to put myself in, the, in that side's arguments, in that sort of, to play uh, devil's advocate as it were, let's say that you accept the idea of a developmental state, you at least need skilled individuals, skilled bureaucrats to run that state, to use taxes efficiently, that sort of thing. And as we'll see now with the state of the economy, South Africa has this idea of a developmental state without the substance to back that up. So we've got this theory, but not the practicality in terms of actually delivering on that promise. Looking at South Africa's real GDP growth compared with uh, the world average and emerging markets. So we go from 94 until recently. And again, you'll see the tale of two eras. So we've got South Africa on the red bars. You can see doing... A bit better from 94 until about 2007, 2008, there was better growth, more job creation, more investment. Then, of course, we had the global financial crisis. After that, steadily uh, ever downwards, just hovering over 2%, boosted by things like commodity booms. We, of course, export a lot of raw materials, so we were helped by that sort of thing. Um, and then we had, of course, COVID-19 and government lockdown, so a big uh, dip there and a bit of a bounce back. You can see recently... There has been a bounce back, but I think that's mostly because of just how bad this dip was. That doesn't mean that things, that the fundamentals have been fixed, as it were. I think going forward, we would be lucky if we would breach 2% growth per annum for the next five years. And that, again, means no substantive job creation, for example. So just comparing us now with the world average on the black bars, you can see sort of outstripping South Africa, especially after the global financial crisis. But the most concerning matter and this one on emerging markets is because no country gets it right. I mean, I think if anyone promises you utopia and perfect employment, you should be very wary of those promises and perfect, you know, a perfect society. But some countries at least get some of the fundamentals right. And if you look at emerging markets based on those orange bars, how much better those countries are doing at the moment. Uh, emerging out of COVID, if you look at downturns in places like China and the Eurozone, maybe countries like Brazil, India are now going to be doing better and taking some of the space that South Africa could be using if we actually had our growth fundamentals uh, in place. Countries like Australia as well, taking some of that Indonesia. Um, so if we don't turn this around, I think this trend will, will steadily continue. Looking at GDP per head for South Africa and the world average, so just people's average income. Looking at South Africa, a steady increase, but look at the world average outstripping that quite a lot. And just to point your attention uh, here to around 20, 2009, 2010, and going here till 2020, we're reverting back to where we were in 2009, 2010. So effectively losing all that time. Now we're reverting back to lower levels. So we really aren't getting that basic idea of right of growing the economy, of inclusive growth, just basic wealth creation. Looking at the state of employment, or perhaps in, unfortunately in the South African context, we should say unemployment, uh, just this week, the latest employment figures were released, so unemployment up slightly, unemployment also slightly down by a percentage point, but it doesn't really paint that rosy picture that the country needs. I don't think it's anything to write home about. It maybe gives a sense of a false sense of security, um, if you think about the millions of South Africans who are actually unemployed. So the unemployment rate in South Africa, you can see again this idea of the 
tail of two eras going downwards towards 2008, the unemployment rate on the expanded definition, and then going ever upwards after that to where in the first quarter of this year we were at 45%, it's now on 43%. So that two, two percentage points that you're down. I don't think it's reversing nearly fast enough. And again, compared to other emerging markets, <coughs> not to where we should be. So it's fine to create some jobs here and there, maybe in something like the finance sector, but not in construction, for example, because we don't have reliable electricity supply. The, the mining sector is suffering at the moment. You could create a lot of jobs there, but we're not using that low hanging fruit, as it were, to really create jobs for the vast majority of South Africans. A uh, former colleague of mine, uh, Becky Machlobo, uh, he put together this particular slide and I think it helps paint, helps us to understand just some of the frustration with the unemployment rate in South Africa because again, that idea that no country is perfect. But if you look at the duration of, of unemployment in South Africa versus um, other countries and then on the longer term versus the short term unemployment. You can see the long-term unemployment going ever upwards as time has progressed, but the short-term unemployment going downwards. So you've got more people, once they're out of work, then they stay out of the job market. It's difficult for them to get back into work. And that adds to that sense of frustration again. And if we can reverse these two trends, that would be ideal. But at the moment, I think we're making it difficult through things, for example, like onerous labor laws, just the size of the public sector, state-owned entities that crowd out small businesses, uh, independent job creation, that sort of thing, that you could argue would be much more transformative and inclusive than the current exclusionary policies which we have, which just favor those with the necessary political connections. Looking at the, op the employment opportunity cost, so this means if we'd, for example, been growing at rates compared to emerging markets, then m many more millions of South Africans would have been in employment. So just to put that in, in context in terms of what we've we've lost so we've got the number of employed people in South Africa just over 14 million uh, recently and if you again to use that time span idea going back to 2008 so we're we're doing as well as we were in 2008 so what have we been doing for the last you know 10 10 years we're really wasting time um, not making enough progress but if you compare that if we'd grown at emerging market rates uh, that red line, we would have been at 24 million. So then you could argue that's a real economic growth, uh, more people included in the job market, uh, creating wealth for themselves and their families, their communities, uh, if we'd grown at those similar rates. Uh, this idea again of the development state and, and social grants, um, you have to say in the context of South Africa's history with apartheid and colonialism, there's a, both an emotive and pragmatic argument to be made for social grants and helping really indigent citizens and those who really struggle, depending on certain parameters and that sort of thing, really helping people to at least uplift themselves in some kind of way with certain limitations. But at the moment, the focus has shifted towards social grants versus job creation. So it's too easy at the moment to increase grants as government might do with a basic income grant, for example. Again, increasing the social relief of distress grant versus removing the barriers to job creation. So at the moment, it's just easy to put more people on grants versus giving them the opportunity to create work for themselves and their families. So if you look at the number of employed people in South Africa, sort of doing okay, we were improving a little bit around 2006, 2007, but not substantially as much as we, we should have been. But then when you compare that to the number of social grants that's paid out, you can see the exponential growth on the orange graph. And that's, that's also not tenable. Um, for example, if you've got a, a government fiscus under pressure, that means government has to cut spending elsewhere, maybe on education or healthcare, for example. So where, which interest group wins out? How does government balance these priorities? How do you sort of deal with that sort of thing? So at the moment, we're just increasing that pressure ever more on the fiscus. And you could also argue, is that really, if, you, if you're serious about this idea of a developmental state, isn't it about capacitating people and actualizing them versus just having them reliant on grants, for example? What, what vision do you have for the future? Looking at the state of the country's public finances, here we have Finance Minister Enoch Kodongwana when he gave his budget speech earlier this year. Um, of course, subsequently, he gave his medium-term budget policy statement where the government coffers look a little bit better than they have in a few years, but I think that's largely been because of the commodities boom. Um, there was a lot of demand for commodities and South Africa as an exporter did well in that regard. 
not nearly as well as we should have been, again, because of those fundamentals. So, for example, electricity supply, uh, railways and ports not operating as they should. We could have benefited much more from the commodities boom, but we haven't done that accordingly. But we'll, we'll dive into that now. So if we look at uh, national government finance as a proportion of GDP, and we're going to look at uh, revenue expenditure and then the deficit. So firstly, the gray line, uh, government revenue, holding somewhat steady, again, boosted here and there by commodities. It's quite impressive coming out of 94, I think, how, how the new government managed to increase revenue and to do better with collecting that revenue uh, compared to what happened before. But then if you look at expenditure, the steady increase after 2007, 2008, that black line, so then you had things like Madupi and Kusile, for example, these big capable state ideas, uh, free public uh, uh, university education, for example, being promised, uh, big spending ticket items, but not necessarily delivering the outcomes they're on. So it's one thing to promise spending, but are you actually delivering bang for your buck, as it were? And then if we look at the deficit as a result, um, again, a remarkable achievement when you think about it, around 2006-7, uh, where we had a, a, a budget surplus. Um, I mean, that takes some proper accounting, some real uh, responsible management of the finances. But after that, you've got this, the serious decline in terms of that. Um, and again, COVID, of course, we had a little bit of a bounce back. But I think this line, it'll sort of hover around there, probably might get to below 2% if we're lucky. But at the moment, I don't see that changing radically. Again, looking at global events, if China and the Eurozone continue with their depressed economic activity as is likely, um, then that means less demand for South African commodities, which means less growth for the South African economy, for agriculture, for mining, that sort of thing. Where do we diversify our exports to? This is a serious risk point, I think, for South African exporters. How do we deal with that going forward? Uh, looking at the budget deficit, uh, this one, we, we thought it's, it would be interesting to place it on a much longer time scale. So we went back to 1913 up until recently. Um, and the reason for that, uh, we will come to as it fills out. I think it's important to look at the effect of pressure on government finances in, to, in light of how does it affect changes in government. So when a government is under more pressure, it can't spend as much as it did before, which means maybe it's going to cut certain spending and that means voters are going to respond accordingly. So here we've got the big budget deficit where we are at the moment and the previous two times where we had similar deficits both times the two respective smuts governments were voted out of power so if you look at historical president there's a bit of a bit of a, a trend there where government can't spend like it used to it's really receding into the background and voters are going to try and respond accordingly uh, maybe here going forward um, the deficit might improve slightly based on the reserve bank and imf's projections but i don't think to a really substantive extent to arrest this kind of change and i think this is a big concern risk point for the ANC specifically. Uh, just looking at gross government debt, so again, this idea of a developmental state, do you have then various demands on the state and state spending? Where does the state spend its money? Um, where does it allocate resources? So if we break it down, um, we had government debt, again, an achievement. I have to point this out for the, and I know I'll be, be it pilloried by the libertarians in the, in the crowd. But giving government at least some credit for bringing down government debt, um, doing relatively okay. And then around 2008, 2009, again, that reversal going ever upwards. Which means when government has to pay more in terms of debt and the interest on debt, that's less space for it to spend on actual needed services, for example, on things like education and healthcare. Uh, so here we broke down uh, government expenditure, so you can see uh, certain items, certain line items together with each other, things like education, healthcare, debt, etc. Um, so if you look at them, relatively the same in terms of size, but here I want to point your attention to the top band, especially in terms of um, debt servicing costs. So that is that was sort of stable for a while and has been steadily ever increasing, and as this wedge increases, it presses down on everything else. And you're going to see less spending in these other areas and less prioritization, which means, again, how are voters going to respond to that in terms of their priorities? Where are they going to put pressure on government? Um, I think government is going to collect ever, ever less revenue, again, because of less demand for commodities and also just lower tax revenue. The tax base under a lot of pressure. 
So where is that money going to come from to service that debt? And a lot of pressure on the government in that regard. So looking at South Africa's growth fundamentals, we sort of looked at where, where we have come from and where we are at the moment, but now trying to figure out why aren't we getting things right um, when we think there's a few sort of areas to highlight in this regard. So we're going to look at electricity, education and fixed capital formation. Those are three that we feel important to highlight. So firstly, electricity, as all of us are too, unfortunately, too familiar with um, ESCOM as a state monopoly, of course, uh, forcing you to buy its product, even if it can't deliver that product. But here we look at energy availability factor and the unplanned outage factor. So um, maybe if we want to be kind, we can't expect them to always operate power stations to operate 100%. But then at least there should be contingencies for, uh, for unplanned outages. There should be backup services, that sort of thing. And at the moment, I think it's running away from ESCOM. Uh, so if you look at their energy availability factor, around 84% in 2011, and then the steady decline uh, ever downwards, where we are now at around 59%. Uh, a recent report from ESCOM themselves, so you, I mean, take it with a pinch of salt, as it were. They foresee that at least for the next five years, they won't resolve their own load shedding problems. I, I don't think they're ever going to resolve it to an adequate level. And load shedding acts as an effective cap on growth. So as we reach sort of 2% growth, uh, the grid and ESCOM can't handle that, which means load shedding, which again means lower growth. So you're in this sort of vicious cycle. That means, again, fewer job opportunities being created uh, and, and a higher opportunity, a less uh, opportunity cost for investing in South Africa. And then if you compare that graph with the unplanned outage factor, so to around 6%, in 2011 and then the st ever steady increase to above 28 percent recently so i think escom at the moment is really struggling to to just do the basics right maybe we if we want to be kind we don't expect them to turn things around overnight but even in this case they're not getting those basics right of of power plant maintenance for example um, just making sure that things run as they should do and i i struggle to see where this trend is going to be reversed anytime soon of course escom has a new board now but it's still, I mean, for the ANC themselves, the ESCOM is a vital part in terms of control over the state. You can't expect the party to let go of some of its core tenets, some of its core requirements, and ESCOM is one of those to be in control of the levers of the state. So, yes, there's a new board, but ultimately they are still report to government, and ultimately which interest groups get served, which don't. I mean, Minister Mantash... For example, he might, you know, focus on certain interest groups and others not. Um, but then you run into this competition where at the end of the day, service isn't improved. Uh, basic maintenance isn't done. Uh, looking at, at our next growth fundamental, education. Uh, at, the end, at the end of every uh, matric cycle, uh, the Minister of Basic Education talks about uh, very proudly the number of students who passed matric, who got entrance to university and and we can celebrate that to some extent, but we also look, have to look at it in the context of who was left behind. So we've got spending on education, we've got f uh, free university education, for example, but is that actually benefiting young South Africans who you could argue um, are at a disadvantage when they're saddled with this sort of education system? So we took the number of pupils in grade one in 2010 and then tracked them throughout their school career to see how many made it through uh, to matric and to university. So we had around just over a million in 2010, and those who made it to grade 10, still over a million. You lost uh, just under 100,000, so not, not too bad, at least until grade 10. Those who made it to grade 11, you had a drop there, a more substantive drop. Then those who made it to grade 12, 750. So from already from grade 1, you've already lost maybe a quarter of your cohort. And then those who were NEC candidates who wrote in 2021, 704,000. Those who got their NEC passes, just over half a million. So you started at over a million, and then you're all the way down to just over half a million. Those who got their bachelor passes, 250,000. And then finally, those who got the math pass mark of 50% or above, just under 60,000. So you're spending on education. You're telling young South Africans, where we care about you. You can go to school. We'll pay for it. But you're not equi equipping them correctly, and a lot of them are dropping out. And what do you, how are you accounting for that? Where are they included or not? What programs do you have in place? Um, how do you deal with that demand for a meaningful life? <coughs> and then finally, our third growth fundamental in terms of gross fixed capital formation. So often we have President Ramaphosa, just because he's the easiest example, I will, I will use him. 
um, but he talks at various summits about investment and we'll, we're going to get more investment in the country and companies promise a lot. But the numbers aren't backing that up in terms of gross fixed capital formation. So you can have promises of job creation, but if you don't have capital, you don't have businesses being formed. You don't have um, mine shafts being sunk. You don't have factories being built, that sort of hard capital that you need to create jobs. You don't have that sort of thing happening. So we, we were at a high of 22% in 2007. But since then, uh, ever downwards, and to highlight again, 2007, 2008, that was around the time that the ANC very hard and clearly adopted expropriation without compensation as a core deliverable. So it promised that it would implement this in terms of the constitution. It hasn't yet, but even the talk thereof and the promise thereof, you just increase the risk premium of South Africa. So if you compare us to other emerging markets, why would you, as an investor, undertake that risk? Maybe it never happens. Of course, we hope it doesn't happen. But maybe you hedge your bets and you think maybe it's better not to invest versus to take that risk in terms of building a factory or something. And also, just to highlight, when you, when you read about uh, capital formation and investment in the country, try and find out whether it's actual uh, brownfield or greenfield investment. So brownfield, for example, just upgrading systems, just uh, optimizing operations, that sort of thing, not actually investing new capital. So the greenfield is the the more investment that you want. But I think at the moment we're skewing more towards the brownfield, just optimizing things. So you, you still invest in the country, but you protect yourself a bit more. You automate, you make sure that your factory maybe is smaller, but it's more optimized, all that sort of stuff. So to sum up then, some of the key risks to South Africa's economic performance, you've got collapsing infrastructure in terms of transport, energy, water, and communications. That last one, especially to highlight, I think we underestimate if, for example, the grid went down, how would you handle your communications? You as your business or as an individual or communities, how are you going to communicate with your loved ones and those around you? And then also water. I think that might well, that chicken might come home to roost quite soon. We're already seeing signs of it here and there. But again, that idea of not doing the basics right in terms of maintenance and, and I'm trying to still formulate this idea, but that idea of sort of entropy and, and things just falling apart naturally, if you don't do the work to maintain things and build things, they are going to fall apart naturally. So where are we spending? Where are we prioritizing? Uh, you've got the declining capacity of the public administration. Uh, how, do you, how do you as a business and an individual deal with that in terms of getting your necessary documents if you want to conduct business or travel or that sort of thing? You've got the policy environment, so things like localization, indigenization, regulation, property rights, issues all around those pain points. Um, and maybe as government becomes more desperate, we might see a doubling down of some of these policies where they feel they just need to implement them a bit harder and then things will be solved. But I think it's going to result in even more of the worst consequences. You've got the chronic skill shortage, unemployment and social instability. On this particular point, when we brief uh, clients uh, in sort of education, um, community initiatives, that sort of thing, I, I mean, one can focus on the risks, of course, and you should, but also the opportunity here. So how do we ensure that we work in communities and businesses to, to upskill those around us, to make sure that everyone can maybe weather the, weather the coming storm? How do people work together when things don't go so well? We saw some of this, of course, last year in the riots, where communities across racial lines, across uh, faith backgrounds, just try to work together to protect their property. And I think there's an opportunity for that as well. And then finally, the global risks for a, a small economy like South Africa, um, our currency depreciating, possibly uh, market contractions, things like carbon taxes, uh, the, Europe, the Eurozone uh, soon going to ban the import of uh, petrol, petrol uh, combustion engines. That's a big export for South Africa. How do those companies deal with that sort of thing? Can we pivot accordingly? How do we deal with that opportunity if we lose that opportunity, for example? Uh, next, we're going to turn to the likelihood of reform. Um, I'm probably uh, burying the lead here, but we chose this image of a bridge in Cape Town, um, a, a new bridge that was not completed. Um, so this gives you an idea of our, our, our view uh, of the likelihood of reform. <laughs> yeah. And when we talk about reform, I don't mean a spectrum auction, for example, um, or lifting the cap on self-generation that was 100 megawatts to nothing. There you still need a license from NERSA, for example, but if you can generate. By reform, we mean things like labor law reform. So it's easy for smaller businesses to operate. We mean uh, ease in terms of tax compliance, red tape, bureaucracy, um, things like BE, um, 
where it hasn't where it has until this point favored those with the political connections and not the vast majority of black south africans those kinds of reforms is what we're talking about not the surface level things that were promised um, on the localization point and just the trade point a particular area of interest of mine that i have to work in here uh, transnet earlier this year said that uh, they would open up slots on on the railways on rail corridors for private sector investment so we had the bidding period and just last week uh, on the the container corridor from Joburg to Durban, there were two bidding companies and neither were successful. Uh, but this process comes with a caveat that Transnet remains the owner of the infrastructure. And secondly, it's only for a period of two years. Mm -hmm. So is that really reform or is that, you know, we want to talk reform, but not deliver in terms of substance? Uh, for this particular exercise, we looked at the ANC-NEC, so the National Executive Committee, the composition thereof, those implicated in serious corruption, those not implicated and unknown. I'm sure I'm speaking to a room of 100% people. If you were in this position and there was a chance that you were implicated in corruption, you would implement the reforms that would mean you would end up in jail because you're all such uh, people of integrity and honesty. But it's also a game of simple self-interest and incentive. So would this happen or not? In our view, not. Uh, the vast majority implicated in serious corruption, those not implicated, eight, and the unknown, 31, at this point in time. And then just if you look at, at opinions on reform, so if you look at ministers' views on things like reform, ministers like, uh, again, Gwede Mantash, uh, Fikile Mbalula, who manages to fix everything he touches. Um, if you look at the balance of opinion in the cabinet, so those who are pro-fundamental reform, anti-reform, and possibly open to reform, in our view, um, you've got the vast majority anti-reform and then a small possibility open to reform. But at the moment, I think the ANC is in a corner maybe in terms of where it is at the moment where the destructive effects of its policies are being felt by South Africans. But also, if it doesn't retain those policies and that control, it loses patronage networks. It loses the access that it has to state resources. And that simply means we won't see those substantive reforms that lessen state power and open up more room for private sector economic activity. We, we've encountered the idea quite often that uh, just vote a bit harder for President Ramaphosa, maybe in 2024 vote for the ANC and give him a stronger mandate so that he can change the party and reform it and push it in a different direction. So to better undertake that idea and that exercise, we compared his own favorability versus how the ANC performed in 2021 to see if he's that strong or not. So among South African voters, there's a favorability rating for President Ramaphosa of six, over 60%. Uh, this was in 2021. And then in terms of how the ANC performed and the local election results, 46%. So in our view, there is no more popular figure than President Ramaphosa. And I think within the party, they realize he might be their best hope for still have a, presenting a better image of the party as such. Uh, in my view, he has a very strong hand, but again, that idea of competing interest groups, um, but also his own view of social compacting and not wanting to rock the boat because what comes before the good of the country, the good of the party. You don't want to shake the party too much. You want to make sure that every constituency is happy. You don't want to move that around too much. And in that regard, I don't think he's going to use if he is re-elected at the December conferences, I think he will be. And if the ANC wins in 2024, I don't think you're going to see President Ramaphosa really shaking the party by the neck and, and moving it in a more pro-growth direction. Uh, turning next to voter priorities, uh, we, we thought this was particularly important because we often, and not to just zero in on the ANC, but many politicians, I mean, that is sort of part of their their marketing and their game, they will have to try and convince you to vote for them. So they tell us what we what we think we want, what they think we want. Um, and that's why we should vote for them. Uh, so we did, again, um, some polling to try and figure out what are some of the priorities for South Africans. We did this in 2021 again. Uh, respondents were asked these questions in their in the language of their choice um, to just try and account for some biases and that sort of thing, that sort of importance of language to see how it, um, how it shakes out. Um, so in terms of the, the outcomes, uh, you see at the very top, uh, unemployment or creating jobs as the most serious problem in the country, again, with a 44% unemployment rate of little surprise. Uh, the abuse of women or children, again, because this was in 2021, so coming out of lockdowns, you would have had the exacerbation of the abuse of women and children as people were forced into 
smaller um, compartment, smaller rooms, that sort of thing, um, f not able to move around. Um, so that's why you might have had this uh, slightly higher. And you've got corruption and load shedding and then education, water, crime and safety. If you go to the very bottom, you've got things like infrastructure, racism, BE, land reform. Again, because it's a poll, you get, we're asking people to, to put what they see as the most serious problem, which doesn't mean these aren't problems for, for South Africans on the ground. But I think this points to maybe the idea that they don't think government is best suited to solve these problems. So they might encounter some of this in their daily lives, they might not. But do they think government should really be spending time trying to solve this sort of thing? Uh, arguably not in terms of their policy priorities. Uh, turning next now towards the political shift and now we've done where South Africa has come from, where it's been, and now moving towards where it might be going. Um, so now we get into the fun part of the scenario planning and uh, the trying to predict what, what could happen or what, what might not as we head towards 2024. So here we took um, the ANC and the EFF as a broad church, broadly ideologically aligned, maybe the, the EFF more hardcore in that, in that regard, trying to really push the ANC in that more left-wing direction. And then we've got the opposition broad church. So parties like the DA, Freedom Front, ACDP, um, not good, probably. Uh, that's the, their their own thing. Uh, the IFP probably put in that in that camp. Um, yeah, to just see where support has come from, wh what the historical trends have been, and where it might be going in the future. So we use as our basic measuring stick GDP growth. Uh, as GDP growth increased, you will see that support for the ANC increased accordingly. They implemented reforms after the socialism and economic uh, repression, uh, human rights uh, abuses and crime of apartheid, and they were rewarded for those reforms at the polls. So you could see as GDP growth increased, support for the ANC increased, as GDP growth has declined, the ANC has performed accordingly uh, less well, where we are in 2021, where they uh, performed very badly. Uh, then if you add EFF support into that broad church idea, you can see that they were doing slightly better, but it's still this big drop at the latest elections and perhaps pointing to what might be coming in the future. And then you've got the black line, the, the broad opposition uh, support for them. As GDP growth declined, support for them increased. So they did slightly better, maybe not as much as they should have been due to their own, own goals, uh, maybe not doing things right, not prioritizing their messaging, that sort of thing. But again, you had an upswing in terms of the latest election. So maybe South Africans feeling that there is now time for um, an opportunity for voting a bit differently and then just looking forward uh, if we if we engage in that idea of, of uh, scenario planning <coughs> where if you look at again this basic measure of uh, GDP growth and how low that will probably be maybe not breaching two percent for the next five years lower um, job opportunities more unemployment <coughs> one could say based on past trends that means less support for the ANC again at the polls where in 2024 they could very well get under 50 percent might not be enough if they for example went with the EFF they could still get above 50 percent if they formed a coalition but then you've got the chance for increased support for the opposition parties uh, if people feel that the opposition parties are actually giving them a good value offering again it's on them it's not a given I think that's also maybe for the opposition parties they shouldn't assume that people are just going to vote for them if they don't show that they're serious about the ideas and also just the, the delivering in terms of service delivery. Uh, this particular slide, not to this one, we didn't put in to try and emphasize that we sometimes at least get some of these calls right, but more in terms of the other categories so that it can highlight how important that is. So here we've got our own estimates in terms of the 21 elections and how we thought the different parties would perform. We had the ANC at 49, DA 22, EFF 12, and the other parties, the smaller parties at 17. In terms of the actual outcomes, the ANC did slightly worse than we thought. The DA we got exactly right. The EFF also did worse than we thought. But here's the important point, those other parties. Um, voting for smaller independent parties, I think a lot of people underestimated that this could come about in the South African political context. We were always focused on the bigger parties, and I think here you've got a sign of things to come in the future. And then finally, we come to the scenarios. So back to this idea of the ANC as the mighty buffalo dominating 
the political savannah, but what's going to happen now going forward. So I mentioned uh, people maybe hoped or expected that a line would emerge to take down the buffalo. But in our view, uh, the uh, higher probability or a chance at least could be a pack of wild dogs. If those wild dogs work together, if they don't continue backstabbing each other, that sort of thing. Um, if dogs picked up knives and backstabbed each other, uh, then you, you could see that sort of thing. So how we do our scenarios, we've got on the... Um, at the top, we've got ANC support above 50%, and at the bottom, ANC support below 50 and then on the other axis, on the one hand, effective reform strategy versus no reform strategy. So this can help you sort of lay things out if you try and figure out these scenarios um, in your own view. So in our first scenario, we've got the Buffalo charging. So we've got an effective reform, reform strategy, which means ANC electoral support goes back to above 50%. We've got the wild dogs making the kill. We've got ANC support below 50% and those wild dogs working together, getting enough votes to implement some reforms at least into later into the decade. You've got the hyenas plundering the carcass, so you've got ANC support below 50%, but no effective reform strategy. And then possibly the ANC going into coalition with a party like the EFF. And then finally the buffalo stumbling on. So the party is still retaining around 50%, but no effective reform strategy, which means we continue sort of as we are around 1% growth, high unemployment, uh, sort of always an un instability in terms of the country. So just to give you the particular way it, it can shake out the different scenarios, so the buffalo charging, uh, you've got sweeping labor, empowerment, energy, education, and property right reforms. You've got growth rates averaging 5% by 2029. It won't happen overnight, but then you've got the debt curve peaking and dipping and the RAND strengthening. You've got living standards and jobs resuming that trend from 94 until about 2007. Confidence in the ANC rises and they secure a moderate majority in 2024 and support rises into 2029. So the party sort of rises as the, the proverbial phoenix. Uh, then the wild dogs making the kill scenario. Uh, in this particular one, you've got reforms being delayed, so sort of dithering around the edges. You've got the ANC majority below 50% in 24 and five years of unstable coalition. And I, I particularly want to draw your attention to the unstable coalition. Um, maybe we think if the ANC gets voted out, the part, other parties will work together and things will work very well. I think we're going to have, have a lot of horse trading difficulties in terms of priorities, budgets, all this sort of stuff. So don't think if, if the ANC gets below 50% in 2024, everything will just turn around sort of overnight. Then in 2029, you'll see a new political player dominating the coalition. Um, maybe in the past, we thought someone like Action SA. Um, how will that party play its role in coalitions? Uh, will it reverse some of its previous trends and focus on the coalition as a whole or continue sort of undermining uh, particular agreements and that sort of thing? Uh, so maybe a different player, um, a sort of center-right in the South African context. Uh, and that means sweeping structural reforms, introduced foreign assistance, and then you've got the growth, uh, debt, jobs, and living standards resuming and recovering through the 2030s. So a hopeful, relatively more hopeful scenario, but only if you've got the staying power to remain in the country until about 2030 and longer, um, then you can, th then you might see an improvement in terms of uh, standard of living. Uh, next scenario, uh, probably the worst one, if it comes about, the hyenas plundering the carcass. And in this particular scenario, you've got reforms again failing to materialize. The ANC majority below 50% in 24, but this triggers a populist or nationalist coalition with a party like the EFF, for example. You've got expansive expropriation, uh, asset prescription, uh, nationalization of the Reserve Bank, for example. You've got the debt and the deficit blowing out, currency printing, and skilled South Africans of all races, backgrounds, trying to leave the country where, where they can. And then finally, you've got living standards reversing dramatically and civil rights being impeded. So for example, not having as vibrant an NGO space as we do, or a media space, or even um, a relatively still healthy court system, uh, all of that would, would reverse in this, in this particular scenario. And then our final scenario, we've got uh, sort of status quo things persisting on as they have been. So the buffalo stumbling on, a very tired looking buffalo, but uh, no other animal able to take it down. So you've got fruitless reform rhetoric um, and economic exclusion deepens. You've got unemployment still hovering around 50%. The ANC capitalizes on that exclusion to hold majorities. 
and the opposition flounders. So this is a crucial point for this scenario where the opposition doesn't take advantage of the political environment to take down the buffalo. And then South Africa underperforms emerging market peers into the 2040s. You've got maybe this idea of the enclave, so middle, upper middle to richer <coughs> South Africans can still state proof themselves, go off grid, they're, they're fine. But for the majority of South Africans, they don't have that ability and they, they continue to sort of suffer along, um, as it were. And just to finally summarize again, we've got our four scenarios. Um, the fun thing and the irritating thing with scenario planning is you try and uh, devise them and strategize them so that each is as likely as the other. So not to say that one is going to manifest more than the other one, but you try and prepare accordingly for each one so that you can, you, your family, your business, your community, you can be okay no matter which one happens to play out. So that's the idea uh, behind the scenarios. Uh, with that, thank you very much for your, your attention. Um, I open the floor to, to questions and yeah, thanks very much. lot of time talking about unemployment and our unemployment uh, figures have soared on expanded definition. What if we take into account people that are uh, informally employed? Mm -hmm. uh, what do those numbers look mm -hmm. like? I imagine that a lot of people who aren't formally employed have found some yeah. way to make a living that's not just yeah. in grants. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and I mean, someone I can recommend with the specific in-depth research on this GG Alcock. But I think you highlight something important in the South African context that maybe we lose sight of as economic, as economists and analysts, where we just focus on the formal economy, but not just how citizens, by, by being forced into it, they're more resilient than we give them credit for. And they try and make a plan. They try and run independent businesses. Um, they try and ensure that they can still put food on the table for their families, even through lockdown, for example. They continue to do this. And this might be a, an opportunity and... and uh, light at the end of the tunnel in the South African context where people have by virtue of their circumstances made sure that they can continue operating so they can continue to do so into the future that idea of resilience um, I think that's very important to highlight and maybe a, a blind spot that we have um, I think that's important to acknowledge it would be interesting to see um, how people have state proof themselves over time mm -hmm. so looking at let's say the number of private schools yeah. private hospitals uh, private police, mm -hmm. um, you know, since 94. Yeah. The other thing that I thought important thing to take into account is um, the population growth since 94. Mm -hmm. So when you say we had 14 and a half million people employed, we have the same number today, mm -hmm. the proportion has gotten yes. much worse. Yeah, the relativity. No. Yeah, so if you'd, I know there's concern, you know, some people, there's concerns around immigration and population growth. and But for me, that idea of you've got more mind solving, more solving problems, you've got more human resources, human capital. So it should actually be we should be doing a lot better than we are. But I think we're, by virtue of the wrong ideological choices, so, you know, in my view, uh, consequences, concrete consequences are downstream from policies which are downstream from ideology. So we've made the wrong ideological choices, which means on the ground now, we're suffering by inhibiting people's human potential and human capital. Just because there are more citizens doesn't mean they've got the opportunity to try and create wealth. And that, going back to that social grants slide, I think at the moment focusing very much on the redistributionist model of, of sort of economics and, and growth versus a creationist and thinking that the wealth pie is fixed and it needs to be reallocated by government in terms of thinking how do we capacitate and open up opportunities for individuals to create wealth for themselves so it's very much state dependence versus independence so david so i think you've uh, explained very well why that current nc government is predisposed against reform mm. because of its ideological convictions. But now if we were to imagine a wild dog scenario, mm. uh, I would imagine that they would be a lot more open to reform, but that might not necessarily be the case, mm. right? So they have quite kind of plural interests mm. that might actually mean no. they won't be able to agree mm -hmm. on policy reform. So how would you advise a potentially incoming wild dog coalition mm. to go about this process of reform. How do you sequence those reforms and what are the most kind of urgent priorities for this hypothetical mm. wild dog coalition? Yeah, if there's one priority, it's public sector reform and incentives and how you, 
how people have done business in the past in terms of their work in the public sector versus how you want them to do it in the future. So at the moment, it's very much a case of, on average, you know, I can't say every single person, but on average where it's just make sure that you don't offend the person who gave you that position in the first place. Whereas it should be about, are you actually performing your job or not? So changing those systems and incentives, those ideas where I've got, to, I've got deliverables, I've got KPIs that I need to perform on. If you can ch start changing some of that at least, I think you'll see the downstream effects because number one, you'll see actual improvement in service delivery, but also secondly, just more a better allocation of, of state resources and tax revenue. And then you give citizens the idea as well that the state is actually responsive and doesn't just want to waste their money on blue light brigades, for example. Um, so that would be one where I particular, put particular focus. And then secondly, there has to be a reform of, of, uh, of bargaining councils and, and, and public sector unions and the power that, that lies there in terms of education because that's one of our growth fundamentals that we don't get right. We, we spend on education, but if a teacher doesn't perform, for example, in the public sector, then nothing effectively happens. So how do you, how do you change that around? I think you have to look at changing those agreements, those bargaining council powers to make sure that the unions can't just, the union leaders can't just get into a room and decide what suits them, what doesn't actually work for the, the people who represent the union and also those who are supposed to get the service from that. Thanks. Ian. Uh, two, two comments. One is on your GDP growth, mm -hmm. the year on year. It gives an over-optimistic mm -hmm. versus if you baselined it. Yeah. At no, I think we, maybe yeah. at a certain yes. point in time. Yeah, yeah I think that, that, that might be a good one to look at. I think we... We just did very yes. nice, like, to see yeah. versus emerging markets. Yes. The other one is on the GDP, referring to Mark's comment, it should actually be GDP per capita. Not per head, yeah. Because that's fallen off dramatically. Right. Yeah. With and the just population increase and the GDP has <coughs> gone down. Yeah, and then not having that sort of disposable income, for example. If you, yeah, how do you, I mean, if you want to save for your child's future, you don't have that money that you had before. So, and again, now, You've added the, add the issue, I don't know if we, we probably can't have it on the same slide, but the issue of rising inflation, eating away that spending power, that GDP per, per capita, your money doesn't go as far as it used to. Yeah, but the fixed capital formation, apparently the last two quarters, mm. have seen an uptick. Okay. We might so see then the, the benefit there. Yeah. Yes. Okay. have gone up from 13% to 13.5%. Well, hopefully EWC never happens and then we yes. see that, that <laughs> upswing. Maybe I'll, I'll shill for the ANC soon enough. <laughs> uh, let's go, Shaw. You had a graph there, I think from 1913, of mm. uh, the country running at a deficit. Mm -hmm. um, now, South Africa has never been uh, the paragon of uh, liberty. Mm -hmm. Running a deficit from 1913 up to now was a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just keep on doing it. Yes. And uh, so, for me, that's not a problem. Mm. Because the way they finance it is uh, simply through inflation. Yeah. So you just pay off. To yeah. with, uh, and it's been working for, what, yes. 100 years? Well, may, uh, the, 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 I mean, the, the main idea with that was just those, the, the big deficits pointed to changes in government. So that it still operates, but it just might show that now we're running a similar deficit to what we did before. So you're going to have a change in government because that's our focus is on whether the NC is going to get voted out. Now, my scenario is that uh, there will be a run of this and <laughs> government will become um, irrelevant no? and people will solve their own problems mm -hmm. in local communities um, no? as uh, formal systems collapse. We don't need ESCOM anymore. No? We don't need Transnet anymore. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No. No. The state is leaving that vacuum. No. Is it? Mm. So, in the most serious problems in the country, on the top three, to me, they look like a selfish interest, mm. public welfare. And if that is the case, how would you um, advise coalition parties to um, entice voters to focus more on welfare, um, you know, issues? Because mm. that's what would better the country in, in the sense that we infrastructure, mm. the EDC. How would you advise coalition to, you know, entice Mm. Yeah, if those coalitions can send me the check in the mail, you know, I'll send them this advice. Um, 
but if, yeah, if you play it to people's self-interest, this idea of if we vote for better ideas and policies that enable economic growth and job creation, over the long term, you selfishly will benefit from that. So you as well, as a voter and a citizen, you'll be living in a society with increasing living standards, better service delivery, more job opportunities. Maybe you want to change your own job, for example. You're only going to get that in a more dynamic system. So if you can vote for a party that promises you that and delivers that, I mean, promises are one thing, but actual delivery. If you can play to people's self-interest in that way, and also just in terms of, it's a bit intangible, but living in a country and a society that is more based on respecting people as individuals and agents versus just seeing them as you know tick box sort of reliant on the state if you can really appeal to that idea and make sure that people understand if they live in a society where they can act more as individual agents with their businesses and communities it'll be better for them versus everyone just being forced into reliance on the state so i know it's a broad idea but that's at least some of the sort of ideas and advice I would try and give those those parties. But for them as well, if you look at the, the grants issue, for example, that's very difficult to solve at the moment. How do you, how are you, if you come in as a coalition government, how are you going to take that away or change it or reform it or, you know, and that also plays to people's self-interest. So how do you weigh up these different things? I think it's, a, it's quite the challenge for the coalitions. But they've got the opportunity, so let's see if they take it. Yeah, just... Uh Kind of follow up question. Which political parties are actually strongly pro reform? Yeah, so uh, substantively, I mean, I would, off the top of my mind, the DA, the Freedom Front, ACDP, U, uh, IFP, um, those are the ones that jump immediately to mind, Action SA. Uh, the, the EFF is pro reform, but reform more the other way, so maybe not the kind that we particularly need. But those are the ones that, that jump to mind. Whether they would actually implement that is a different thing because you've got your manifesto and you promise privatization, for example, or whatever. But how are you going to do that practically, for example? So you also try and see through the rhetoric sometimes. Yeah, I mean, you get the impression that they, you have these two sides where they're yes. both just fighting to get a, yeah. a bigger share of the pie. Yeah. yeah. Oh, one of our, sorry, just one of our other briefings called Trade Off that's more on the global context and just global events and global finance so I, I just mentioned it for this idea as well of there's no perfect scenario no perfect situation so this idea of trade-offs and certain priorities but if we want to at least put the country on a better trajectory making some choices versus others i'm not saying that i can give you all the answers and each scenario is going to work out perfectly but if you can at least weigh some of the the costs and benefits accordingly then maybe the country can benefit from that Another question, if I'm mm. <coughs> with your that 2021 predictions that you had, um, that was for the local elections. Yes. It, are there correlations between the local elections and the and the national elections? I mean, over the years. I mean, so so you, I said this is with the caveat of voter turnout on the day. Um, is one thing to do polling, and another thing if people actually turn out and and vote in their numbers. Also, in terms of those who voted for the party in the past, the actual base. And whether they turn out but i think there is i think there's a correlation and i say this because again that idea of living standards and and just people's concrete experience you come across this this frustration in certain circles and i get frustrated with that frustration where people say but why would you still vote for the anc and like you know why are you so stupid blah 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 those sorts of kind of uh, paternalistic idea i think you are seeing a change in terms of that there's just the lag effect and things are i mean if you take the anc uh, you know too many metaphors and analogies but the anc for many people based on the role it played in the country's history in terms of changing the country all that sort of stuff for many people was their home an emotional home a sort of you know psychological base and now the coalition parties are coming building a hotel across the street and it's shiny and new no leaks there's power but it's not someone's home. How do you convince them to move into a new building, for example? I think slowly but surely people are seeing the effects in terms of their daily life, but it's up to the coalition parties to speak to their values. And I think based on our polling and just South Africans experience, sort of an analogy, but people want the radically basic stuff of the job and stability and security. How do you appeal to that in a way that doesn't treat them in a sort of, I know what's best for you kind of way and actually delivers on the promise. Oh. Thanks. Any other questions? Mark? So, one of the things we're with regards to ANC support 
is that the demographics have changed quite dramatically mm -hmm. since 94, but the ANC's numbers mm -hmm. you know, have either remained constant or dipped. Yeah. So there are a lot of people who aren't voting for opposition parties, they're just not voting at right. all. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so you know, if the uh, expected ANC supporters continue to support them, they would have annihilated mm -hmm. the other parties or not. Yes. The other thing is, you know, with reference to this earlier question about uh, GDP per capita, mm -hmm. there's something incredibly uh, unhelpful about telling someone this is what the average is, because right. no one in this room is an average South African. Yes. Um, what is useful is to find out in your particular LSM what things look like over time, mm -hmm. um, and which which sort of sectors have been eradicated over yeah. time, which sectors have done quite well. Mm -hmm. When you think about COVID, um, some people um, did really badly, well. and you know some companies just soared. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting to kind of look at uh, that growth over time, yes. who's benefiting, who's not. Uh, which groups have ascended, which haven't, and then what do companies look like? Yeah. Again, I imagine a lot of companies that were around only four aren't around anymore, so they've consolidated and disappeared. Mm -hmm. Which sectors are being eradicated? Which sectors have grown? Yeah, yeah it's easy to throw out statistics and numbers, but it, I mean, I know some of us will snicker at this, but people's lived experience is, is I mean, the phrase has meaning for a reason. People's like experience on the ground. Yeah, I just want more stats yes. and more of my own stats. Right, so. yeah, in, in co contextualized, though, yeah. not just floating around. Oh, thanks. Any other questions? Going, going. <laughs> Gone. <laughs> oh, one more. <laughs> yes, I can definitely make them available. Yeah, if you can give me your email address, yeah, we'd, we'd love to share them. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a sort of example of, of our main briefing that we did this year to most of our clients, but we also do bespoke projects, research, all that sort of stuff. We provide all our sources for our data if you're interested in that, so please get in touch and we can we can assist with that yeah. interrogate the data as well and tell us what you what you find thanks thanks very much thanks everyone there's still some food and drinks so please uh, be around and be merry <laughs>